welcome to a love-filled special edition of More Than Pixels on a Screen, a podcast brought to you by the Banderflix Movie Review website. <coughs> Sorry, I had something stuck in my throat there. So, yes, as always, we're going to be talking in spoilerific detail. I'm your host, Jim McLean, and on this episode, we're going to be talking about Titanic. It's been recently re-released in cinemas, and it's celebrating its 25th anniversary. More importantly, it's been re-released in cinemas in 3D. And joining me as we set sail to talk about James Cameron's classic is our... Resident Disney Queen, Victoria Brown. Hello. Uh, have you grew to love that song yet? No. Okay. <laughs> you want well, me to be honest? That's okay. You know, it, it's meant to be love. We're feeling the love, but you're not feeling any of it for your little theme tune. And one half of Band of Flicks' Sleuth Sisters, that is, of course, our deputy editor, Joe McElroy. Hello, everyone. Hello, guys. We're going to be talking about Titanic. And I think without any further ado, before Billy Zane can get a chance to get his gun out, Let's play a clip of the film. And where exactly do you live, Mr. Dawson? Well, right now my address is the RMS Titanic. After that, I'm on God's good humor. And how is it you have means to travel? I work my way from place to place. You know, tramp steamers and such. But I won my ticket on Titanic here at a lucky hand at poker. A very lucky hand. Mm. All life is a game of luck. Mm. A real man makes his own luck, Archie. Right, Dawson? Hmm. And you find that sort of rootless existence appealing, do you? Well, yes, ma'am, I do. I mean, got everything I need right here with me. Got air in my lungs and a few blank sheets of paper. I mean, I love waking up in the morning not knowing what's going to happen or who I'm going to meet, where I'm going to wind up. Just the other night, I was sleeping under a bridge, and now... Here I am, on the grandest ship in the world, having champagne with you fine people. <laughs> I'll take some of that. So that's a clip of Titanic, released in cinemas in 1997, won 11 Oscars, directed by James Cameron. Joe, I know we have already done a, a podcast about Avatar, Avatar 2 technically, although we talked about the first one as well. There is an episode of True Lies coming up. This has kind of turned into a, an unofficial James Cameron retrospective, so we thought with Valentine's Day upon us and the fact that Bandaflix was invited to Cine World to try out the 4DX 4DX listeners experience of James Cameron's masterpiece just how he intended it just to be like the Dunluce Centre and Turbo Tours all those years ago but uh, we got invited down to that you can see our little video on our Facebook page, on our Instagram feed as well about how we got on there but we're going to look back at the film so when I put the feelers out, there was one person came to mind. And that, of course, was our, I'll not sing it, was, was of course, our lovely Victoria Brown. Because I think it's fair to say, Joe and I have never been, nor never will be, a teenage girl. Right? I'm sure there was a time in your life where you were a teenage girl. So, therefore, I would imagine you would be key target demographic for this film. When it was released, the key question is, to make me feel old, how old were you back in 97? I was a year and a half. So you were key audience. You were the exact <laughs> person that James Cameron was, was aiming for. Whatever floats his boat, I guess. There we go. No pun intended. So you, you are a fan of Titanic. Yes, I am. And I know there's event you, an event you want to talk about as well. We will keep that. We'll keep that to the serious part, to the end of the podcast. Right now, we'll get through all our nonsense, the usual Banterflix nonsense. Do you remember vaguely kind of when you became aware of the film and, and why? Are, I mean, clearly... Are you a fa- I mean, the first question I'll ask you is, are you a fan of this particular feature? I am a massive fan of Titanic. Um, again, we talk about my mum quite a lot on this podcast. Shock. Weirdly, but uh, this is one of my mum's favourite films, so it plays. Hello, Mrs. Brown. <laughs> Hiya. <laughs> Titanic played on a constant loop in our house. like it was. So it was just Disney movies, Disney movies, Disney movies, Titanic. Disney, Disney, Footloose, Titanic. <laughs> Grease. Grease as well. We talked about this previously. Yeah, it was. It, it is one of my mom's favorite films. And when we were kids, she kind of she would let us watch like the start of it. But once it got to the actual sinking, where it was a bit scarier, she would kind of she would give us a heads up, being like, "Okay, this bit's kind of scary. If you want to turn away, it's okay." I thought you were going to say she just stopped and said, "And they all live happily ever <laughs> after." <laughs> no, my mom's my mom's not like that. Um, 
no, she she was very she's very good at kind of gauging what kids can and can't deal with. She's very like intuitive that way. So the older we got, like me and my sisters, the older we got, we did eventually see the film in its entirety. But we were so familiar with it up until that point anyway. So we all, all three of us, know the film off by heart. Okay, so there's that, Joe. We were talking when we were at Cineworld because I don't think I saw this at the cinema because I was about fifteen. 15, 16 when, the, when this was out. And I know I said that in jest earlier on, that I mean, I wasn't the target demographic. I, I know I wasn't. I, I don't, and I don't even think I was trying to get a cure with a girl, so I had a reason to go see Titanic. I missed it in the cinema completely. And I'm trying to remember, and I'm still struggling to remember when I first saw the film. I have a sneaking suspicion I, I saw at school over the space of like quite a few lessons in history when we were studying Titanic. I could be wrong. So when we went to see it last week at the Cine World, that was the first time I ever seen the film on the big screen. And yeah, enjoyed it. But I mean, we'll not talk about that just yet. But for you, do you have a memory of when you first seen the film? I don't know. Would you have seen it in the film, in the cinema when it was first released? Uh, no, for me, uh, it's a bit like uh, yourself. I would have been, well, I would have been only about seven or eight when it uh, was first released. You bastards cinema. make me feel so old. <laughs> Sorry, I was busy watching Jurassic Park then. I had no time for... Titanic and all that Girl, romantic girly girls stuff. and love. Ew. Uh, no, um, but I do remember when it came out in video, where I, I distinctly remember having the video box, which was two videos. So it was this big, thick, thick thing. You could drop it off a roof and probably kill someone with it. But um, yeah, that, that was my first memory of it. Uh, my main takeaway from it back then was the first half I was like, yeah, stupid girly love stuff. And then. Um, Second half was like, yes, big spectacle, disaster. Crash, bang, wallop, yeah. rinse, repeat. Exactly. Yeah, big manly, yes, class. Look at all that happening. Uh, but then, obviously, the human element, the older I get, I'm like, oh, this is actually very harrowing and, uh, uh, you know, just emotional. Whereas back then, it was like, oh, look at the way the boat, like, splits in half. That's class. <laughs> look at the old fella getting minced in the propeller. Oh, man, fucking class. <laughs> yeah, I, I had the same response and... Funny, I, I will come to this re-watching the film. And as I say, for the first time in the cinema, probably not how James Cameron intended it with, you know, seats shaking us all over the place, water being squirted at us, steam, everything you can possibly think of. Not steam, but just smoke and bright lights, everything going off. As I, as I say, as I said earlier, it was just like a three-hour version of Turbo Tours from Dunluce. And for some people, that sounds like heaven. I know for some other people, like my lovely wife, who suffers from motion sickness at the slightest moment whenever I take her out driving, she's like, no, that is not for me. But I was surprised, A, how much I thought the film held up. A couple of things visually, I think, it doesn't quite work. But even you mentioned Jurassic Park, even Jurassic Park can, can suffer that, to have, be, be hit with that same stick. But how I, much I actually liked it. I mean, I've always been the person, and it's not my line, it's Mark Kermode who always talks about he prefers A Night in November, which I do love as well. And that's a film that is much more about Britishness in crisis and trying to react to this, this what's going on in the ship. Whereas this film, this ver- Cameron, Cameron's version of the film, nearly went James Cameron. James Cameron there. Jimmy Cameron. Jimmy Cameron. <laughs> Jimmy Cameron from Antrim, sorry. James Cameron's film is much more about... Uh, it's a disaster movie and a love story and I will also steal somebody else's line recently Empire did a re-release kind of a little uh, feature for it and they talk about we we look at it being the the love story between Rose and Jack it's a love story between James Cameron and the boat Titanic watching it again in 2023 look at all the stuff that he's done since that you can see that this is someone who completely fell in love with not just the boat, but the story and the mystique about everything that happened. And you see that in almost every frame where he has the ship there. Yeah. No, he's li- he's literally turned into Father Jack in that little dream sequence in Father Ted where he's like, more water. <laughs> he's literally been like that post-Titanic because there's the documentary as well, was it Ghost of the Abyss, mm-hmm. where he like explores Titanic. I think Bill Paxton is hanging about with him then. They're both going down. Hopefully the he didn't there. have his earring. Oh, yeah, that was a big bone of contention for you, but sure, we can get into I, that. I just want to say that, I mean, it's the film's 25th anniversary, and how have I never realised, after all those times I've seen the film, 
Why have I never noticed Bill Paxson's earring? How can you not notice the earring? That's one of the best bits. I didn't notice the earring. It's just when I was watching it on the cinema, on the big screen, while everybody else is kind of like, oh, Jesus, you know, the old woman, she's, she had it all along. I'm like, what the fuck is on his ear? <laughs> <laughs> I can just picture you like, you're in the, near my God to the e montage. You're just thinking, Bill Paxson's earring, Bill Paxson's earring. <laughs> it's like, you know, in the episode of The Simpsons. When the submarine sparkle, sparkle. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> that's exactly what it was like for me. That's that's the only thing. I mean, pretty much the second half of that film, once it kind of goes back in time, I'm still thinking about, did, did, did Bill Paxton, did he have an earring on? Did he? No, he wouldn't. Bill Paxton's too cool for that. The guy that's been killed by a predator, Terminator and an alien. No, he's not going to wear an earring. And then just you're like in the closing moments of the film, you're like, he's a fucking earring on. And it's massive. It's massive. It, it was the 90s. That's all I can say. Kids back then. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So, look, look I don't know really where we, we go from that kind of rambly start. Brian, you, you saw that. We've all rewatched this in the run-up to this podcast. So, Brian, you went to see it at a normal 3D screen, and Joe and I were jolted and swung about the cinema everywhere, and we're practically hitting the ceiling at 4DX. But how did you find it? watching the film in 2023. Do you know, I'm actually very glad that I didn't see it in 4DX because God love your lovely wife, Amber. I get motion sick too, so even the idea of that makes me kind of boke in my mouth a little bit. But the, the 3D was actually okay. Like, I went in a bit like, oh, fuck's sake, do we have to see it in 3D? Like, is there no option not to? But it's it doesn't... I was saying to my mum in the car last night because I went with my lovely mum like I always do. <laughs> it didn't take away from the film, but it didn't add anything either. Mm-hmm. So it it could have, you could have went without it, but it also didn't distract me enough for it to be an issue. I find it's very much like the more modern 3D and the fact that it's there to kind of just, like you said, it doesn't really add anything, but it's not like the pokey pokey 3D that particularly when its resurgence came about again, we think of a few, I mean, when Avatar, of course, when came about, but even Avatar wasn't really that pokey pokey. It was just like films like Clash of the Titans that were very much like, whoa, let's see if we can poke stuff out of the screen. It's not like that. It's trying to build out the picture and trying to add to the visual experience. I don't really think, like you said, Brian, I don't think it really does anything. Joe, when you were being jolted about in your seat, did you notice anything with the 3D? I didn't have a chance. Like I, <laughs> I like you said, I was hitting the roof and everything. I was getting <laughs> soaked, steam shooting into my eyes, you know, uh, Air being blasted the back of me. You were like Jack and Rose at the end of the film, just clinging on to the ship for dear life. Pretty much, but uh, no, um, that's the thing. Like it's a film that wasn't designed to be in three D. So when you're trying to add that element to it, it's just not going to work um, because it's not there by design, like Avatar, or Gravity, or something like that. But I, uh, I didn't really notice it. There's a little bit of it at the start with the like mini sub in and around the Titanic, but. A bit like the 40, 40X experience in general. You just settle into it and you get used mm-hmm. to it after a while. So you don't really notice it that much, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I think you could quite happily have the same experience watching this on a plain 2D screen. But that's just me. My biggest gripe with the film is probably the fact that, and it's probably a big flaw, even though I do like the film, I don't buy the relationship between Jack and Rose. I buy it. Probably from Rose's point of view for Jack, I don't necessarily buy it from Jack's point of view for Rose. Like, this is the guy he hung up out with Paris in Paris with a one legged prostitute. He's been about. I, I don't I don't know. Am I being cynical? You're you're having some facial reactions, Brian. <laughs> so I go don't on, know. Tell us. Go and tell me off if I'm wrong. No, I don't know if it's just me being like a hobbler romantic kind of thing, but. Like you said, from Rose's point of view, you can see why Jack would appeal to her. She's stuck in a high-class life that she feels trapped in. It's it's fucking boring, is what it is. Like, she's miserable. There's nothing in her life that's exciting. And like she says in the film, her whole life has essentially been mapped out for her. Like, even the idea, that's depressing. And Jack represents this kind of hope for a more fun-filled life of freedom, essentially. But... I don't know if, if it's because of the chemistry between Leo and Kate. If it was two different actors, maybe I would be a bit more cynical. But I, I can see why Jack likes her. Like, Rose is tenacious. She's smart. She's strong. She's strong-willed. I, I, I want to clarify that I can see the attraction between the two. I just can't see had... Let's go back in time. Let's make sure that the ship misses the iceberg. I think 
those two get off the boat in New York, I could see Jack quite easily going, yeah, I'm going to go that way. Like a, a summer fling is the only kind of way I can kind of describe it. I've always had a flaw in cinema with this idea of the instant attraction that let's just fall in love. Maybe it's because I'm a guy. I've had to work on things. I'm not one of the beautiful people. I've had to rely on my character, goodwill, banter. I'm not like Jack. I'm not like Leo. I can't, you know, go around dating 19-year-old models, but let's not pull on that thread right now. But I've always had issues with it. And I, and I suppose, I mean, we, we've talked before about films like Grease and stuff and that instant attraction. But even in Grease, we're coming in on something that a, a pre-existing relationship that has been there and kind of, we haven't seen it on screen. It kind of has went a bit askew and now we're seeing it kind of get rekindled. I don't know, is that something you find, I'm opening up to both of you, Joe and Victoria, do you take on bridge where, or do you always believe in that instant, instant, you know, what? and it happens. Walking through the room, you instantly almost fall in love with someone and go, that's the person I'm going to marry. I know the first time I looked at you, Joe, I did have that reaction. But oh, that that's a natural of natural course. reaction, yeah. especially with me. Um, I just have that sort of magnetism to myself, not to blow my own trumpet. But uh, you were like Lady Gaga, and I was your Bradley Cooper. That's it in the shallows. Mm-hmm. And we're not going to sing that song because uh, we're going to get done for copyright, and this podcast will be null and void. But yeah. anyway, um, when it works, it works well. But like you, I don't think it really entirely works in Titanic. That's my big takeaway. I haven't rewatched it because. I hadn't seen it before that for about maybe 10 years. So then when I actually went to the relationship stuff again, I was like, well, you know what? It doesn't really work that well. And I think it's more down to Leo than anything. I think he's miscast. If okay. I, that's my hot take on this. I Interesting. Think, no, no, don't get me wrong. He's hot property then. He's just coming off the back of Romeo and Juliet. He's the big up and coming actor, uh, rising star in Hollywood. But do you really buy him as a man who's traveled the world? done all these things and all that there now he's just sort of like a pretty boy you know that's that's why I find it hard to pretty boys can travel the world uh, but he doesn't it doesn't you get you don't get a sense that he's you know lived a life as such you don't get a sense that he's a guy that sat and done a wonderful painting of a French prostitute well, with one could've. leg no he could have but at the same time I you know I have forgotten about that until it kind of was like going what she's one leg I don't remember this uh, but she's good humour that's what he said yeah she's good humour <laughs> can I just also say at this point after 25 years, Joe like so many scenes, like particularly the scene when Jack is showing Rose all his paintings. That's been ruined for me by internet memes, by by people kind of looking through and it's like the the Pokemon trading cards or it's been like... The like pani- a stick drawn in there. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was one that came to mind and I was just like, oh yeah, it's been ruined. This, this yeah. film has been ruined for me in too many ways over the years. Yeah. No, um... But yeah, so I mean, everything from that just stems from, you know, I think it's Leo more than anything. And it's not that he gives a bad performance. I just don't think he's the right person for the role. Yeah, I think he's fine. Yeah, he's I- fine in it. But uh, he's not the person. I'll definitely buy Kate Winslet as Rose, though. You mm-hmm. know, like I think who was it? Gwyneth Paltrow was the first choice, but then that fell through. I'm kind of glad it did because I don't think I could have bought her really as Rose at that time, maybe. I think she's great. And I think now looking through... I mean, it's unavoidable in 2023 through the post-Me Too year. I mean, there there's added depth. That film that probably I know I, when I first watched it, didn't think think of. Like, there's those scenes between the mother and daughter and talking about this. And, oh, well, like, well, we've no money. We've got to marry this guy. And it's like, well, this is our burden almost. I think that's something like, we did. this is our burden. We are women. This is what we have to do. And he's like, oh, yeah, there's great scene. And there's a great scene that really stuck with me when Rose is at the dinner. Is in the is is up to, is she's in she's in the dining hall and she's looking over and she sees a mother talking down to her daughter and the daughter's only like five or six and she probably sees herself very much still as a supposed adult. I use that phrase as someone who just turned forty last year as a supposed adult, being in the same situation. So that's my thing. That's my thoughts. I mean, coming back to yourself, Brian. I mean, Joe and I are both talking about do we buy the relationship? between the two do you do you buy that relationship see i i do and i'm curious about the the leo thing because i really did buy it when i went back and did a wee bit of research for this they wanted tom cruise for a while but his asking price was too high they wanted jared leto at one point and i that's a meme in itself but apparently 
when Leo went in to do his audition, James Cameron saw something in him. Leo went in not really wanting the role, so he kind of fucked about it and didn't take it seriously. But Cameron said in an interview a couple of years later that he got a very, like, Jimmy Stewart vibe off of Jack. Like, the way that Leo characterised Jack. Like, that kind of bumbling, happy-go-lucky kind of no, thing. No, no, Rose, you're not going to lie. <laughs> jump off the edge of the ship there. Don't you have to ship there. <laughs> Just let my the fight. iceberg, it's in Ted's house, and it's in Bill's house. <laughs> Enough oh, of that. <laughs> Jesus Christ, could you imagine? Um, but no, I, I do. I buy Jack as that, like... The guy that's lived. Can I, can I just clarify, I suppose, from my own point of view? I buy the attraction between the two, but not the idea of two star cross lovers. That two people who've just, in that space of time, like what are we talking, like three, four days? Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I believe. I was trying to work out the miles in my head. To have fallen so madly in love. I mean, it's a 25 year old film. We do say at the start of this podcast, sorry, there will be spoilers. Jack Jack doesn't make it to the end of the film. You know, she lets go. <laughs> she lets go. You know, as much as she says, oh, I'll never let go. You let go, Rose. You let go, the wrong girl. You know, you just, you know. Oh, no, Jim, that's, that's, one of the, what's a, that's what they call metaphors. You know them metaphor things? Yes. I'm, 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 thing in my job. Them old metaphors. Jesus, what are they talking about in cinema these days? Hey, she's, she's not letting go of the promise, but she's letting go of the boy. <laughs> but, but yes... She, I don't buy that sacrifice from Jack at the end. And it's just, it's it's a niggle for me. I suppose a pretty big niggle when it's the whole centre of the film is that you're meant to buy the relationship between these two. But coming back to it now, stuff that maybe it's just kind of my own kind of personal baggage that I bring in now. I mean, the other stuff that's going on hits me much, much more than anything that really I mean there's some nice moments I mean I do love the scene where they're down in down under quarters and they're, or down kind of down below storage is in down in mm-hmm. storage and they're they're doing the dance and she's kind of showing off that she can do ballet ballet like, and she can stand her toes big whoop you know alright I do want to try it can you do it I tried as a child and I cannot so there you go so well I don't know I I don't know I don't know I mean it's it's other stuff that's going on like particularly like stuff we think of Bernard Hill as the captain. And then there's, I will say this, I think the Thomas Andrews stuff is handled much more effectively in A Night to Remember. Interesting. I, I can't remember A Night to Remember too much. I remember glimpses of it because that was another film my granny used to watch like flat out. Because uh, th- th- there's that big scene where they're running through the ship near the end, Rose and Jack, mm-hmm. and they, they encounter... Andrews and he's standing beside the fireplace that's almost scene for scene take out Rose and Jack of course that's very similar to a scene in A Night to Remember it's because it actually happened I was going to I was going <laughs> to ask you that did it actually happen yes it did and even, the even, even the painting that he's looking at that's the actual painting like that that scene is from Eyewitnesses because you can see in the film Thomas Andrews knows that the ship's going down and he he takes that burden on himself he thinks it's his fault mm. and he he was constantly being handed life jackets because the stewards were like, no, Mr. Andrews, you're important. You need to get off the ship. And he was like, no, I, I fucked up. I don't deserve to get mm. off the ship. So that scene where Jack and Rose are running through, I think it's a dining hall, mm-hmm. and he's looking at that painting, that that happened. Right. Uh, the same with the, well, I don't know if the same's with the captain, though. It was in a case of like nobody knows where he went, but they assume he just went down with the ship as well. Um, I believe so. There's Obviously, with history, eyewitness accounts aren't always reliable, and especially... Something when something as scary as that happens, you don't really remember verbatim what happened. But just based on Captain Smith's character, I could see him doing that. Right, and that's history one on one over for now, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the bands. I jest. I, I mean that yeah. sequence with Bernard Hill staring at the screens and the water just break. Oh my God, it just gets me. And mm-hmm. I mean, you've mentioned near to God. I mean, is near to God? Near, near my, my God, God to thee. To thee. Near yeah. my God to thee. I, I yeah, I got a little bit, it got a bit dusty in the cinema screen for me. I was surprised at how. No, it was it was the water jets. It wasn't. It was no, the no, water. No, 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 no. I was surpri- <laughs> I genuinely was surprised, and I mean, I've seen that film quite a few times, and at the screen we were at, Joe, there definitely was a few. I heard blubber. Yeah. I generally heard blubber. That yeah. was from my. That was me sitting right. Well, I was crying too. I'll admit, I was, I, that scene you were just crying me. from being ch- chucked about <laughs> in the seat. I want to go home. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, for a film that. 
I, it's those type of things that really struck with me more than the relationship between Jack and Rose. And I do think there's no... Watching it again in 2023, interesting to see what you think. I don't really think there's much point in the sequence where she paints, where she gets painted like her, his French girls. I don't think it adds anything. I think it's not, well, not so much that scene, but how it's shot. I don't think really Kate needs to get her cleavage out. No, but the whole scene in and of itself is a plot device. You do need it to happen, but mm. whether or not you need to see it to that extent, yeah, you have a point. I, um, I think it's a bit gratuitous, mm. if I'm honest. And I mean, I, yeah, mean, no, no, I, I was a I teenage agree. boy once, you know, so I never never complained. It, it's but, funny, it's like the opposite with what happened with Victoria. You know, you weren't really allowed to see the van and stuff. Yeah. Me and a good Catholic <laughs> household, you're not allowed to look at Kate Winslet. Can't look at the titties, Joe. No, no, but you can watch your man like get electrocuted, drown, everything horrible oh, and imaginable. Oh, that's, grand. that's fine, yes. Yes, because they're no, all... No sex. Yeah, no, 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 no. No, I can't have that. Very pure. No sex, please. We're Catholic. Yes, pretty much. <laughs> Sorry, mother, if you're listening, but <laughs> you, I'm hoping she doesn't. <laughs> she doesn't usually, so it's okay. But yeah, that that's just a thing for me. I don't know, I watching it again I was like did we really need that I mean not the scene but just how it's shot it's a bit like do you know what it reminded me of and it's only popping into my head right now you know in Swordfish with Hal Berry oh yeah where it's literally like she's reading a book and then she just kind of takes the book down <laughs> sorry when I said oh yeah there, it made me sound like a perv <laughs> For those who are, you know, we don't have a visual on this here, but I was like, oh, yeah, 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 I do no, remember no, that. I do recall I that. Uh, but Vic- I wasn't like, oh, yeah, when Harry, Harry Barry left in the, the room, boot down. Victoria and I are both in the room and we've both seen you going, oh, yeah. She left it that It was like Quagmire down. and Scream. Family Guy. <laughs> giggity goo. Giggity giggity. Uh, yeah, no, uh, no, I do see your point in that. Uh, yeah, you didn't really need it, but. It was the most erotic moment of her life. You know, she liked to reveal that in front oh, of yeah. her grandchild who's sitting there going, what? What's <laughs> My whole life's a lie. You had this love affair with this man. My grandfather didn't matter to you as much as this, like, fella you met for three days. That kind of goes back to your point. Can you believe that romance and the mm-hmm. fact that it's endured over those years? But maybe that's just the fun being a bit too earnest and a bit too, you know, leaning on the sort of mawkish side of things. But I don't know. Yeah, proud granddaughter. When she was smiling, tried, I was like, what the hell? Like I know, if my, if my granny was granny sitting was there. Like, no. I'd be like, right, and get out of the room, put me in one of the subs, send me down to the Titanic. I cannot listen to this Just anymore. Leave me there. Yeah. And then there's a hint of a relationship between her and I, Bill Paxton. Maybe she's attracted to the earring. I think the deleted scenes sort of allude to that a bit more. Oh. I think there's a few that sort of, you know, time to go. Because even when the first meet, you're like, oh, there's a little spark of chemistry. Who could resist the Paxton? Can I say, her outfit is the most 90s thing I have oh, yeah. ever seen in my life, but I kind of love it. Oh, it's, 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 it's to differentiate between 1912 and 1990. Oh, of course, you need those, those jeans yeah. and the leather jacket to, to really help you. Beautiful. <laughs> so so we've kind of talked quite a bit about the romance angle, and that's pretty much so what? It's a film that clocks in, it's close to about three or two and a half. No, it's, it's, it's three meant, hours 15. Is that with the credits, though? Because I've yeah. heard it's meant to be 2.40, because that's how long it took the ship to sink. Okay. Because it hit the iceberg at 20 to 12 and then sank, I believe it was about 2.30 or 2.20. Okay. So I, th- I think that was, James Cameron did that on purpose. So it's, wow. the first kind of R is, R and a half is pretty much building up the romance and the, all the kind of nods to the impending doom. It's like, wouldn't you want to get to New York faster? What about the icebergs? No, this ship is unsinkable. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. And etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And then of course there is the aforementioned iceberg. And I mean and I know it's a silly thing, but I forgot just how much I love that scene of the iceberg in the water. Yeah, it's no, it's it's fucking fantastic. brilliant. Like James Warner's score for that, like the oh. way the music just rises. It's quite so Hans slowly. Zimmer-esque. It's, and I can't remember yeah. the film. It's 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 a Chris well, it's obviously a Chris Nolan film. Is it it's Dunkirk? A, it could be Dunkirk because it's the sound of like a clock. It's the sign of it a is gl- Dunkirk. Yeah, it has. To. And it's just that that very similar vibe to that, and you're just trying to watch the ship steer, and we know like. No, no, the thing is, you know that, but watching at the time, you're constantly going, "It's gonna make yes, it. It's like, gonna pass please, it. Please, yes, yes. Please. This time it'll make it because it has the like. I don't know what instrument it is. It's like some sort of drum. It goes gin, gin. That's like the so thing good. from Aliens mm-hmm. that he uses. Like he like the that thing about Horner. He always sort of retreads things out there. But yeah, no, Victoria spot on. That music is just superb. The score it? is fab. Yeah, no, it's, it's one of his. When it's not using the Celine Dion tune, yes. and it uses it a lot in this film. 
Well, that's the thing. He, I think, th- am I right in saying he did the music and that, and she just fitted like lyrics in and around that, or I I'm believe not 100% so because sure. they, they initially wanted um, Enya for it, and she said no. Sail away, sail away, <laughs> sail away. And then James Horner approached um, James Cameron and was like, "What about Celine Dion?" James Cameron was like, "Ugh, no." So they went behind his back and recorded it anyway, and he ended up really loving it. So. That's, that's well, that well that's the thing. Like out of all the films he's done since Titanic, he always ends with like somebody doing a song. Like mm-hmm. I think Leona Lewis did Avatar, and then he had the weekend with Avatar too. They're both shite in comparison <laughs> this year. Because no, no, no. Let's no, be real. Right. Like as much as you might not like the Slain Dion song, it's iconic and it's memorable and it's used in football memes now. Whenever yeah. a team scores a late winner, it's fantastic. I I just remember that song because you were both clearly quite younger, a lot younger than me. This that song was everywhere oh yeah no i do remember my whole childhood was just near far constantly no it's a bit like i suppose if i was young well you'd probably it probably the equivalent for you with robin hood prince of thieves with uh what do you call brian adams Mm -hmm. everything i do do for you that was probably the same thing for us as that was probably for you in terms of being everywhere it was everywhere everywhere i just remember that song it was everywhere like on kind of live and kicking and stuff and then there was the the kind of uh, charge rundown and it's like will Celine, Celine Dion do and be number one again it's like of course she will of course she's going to be number one it was a bit like um, when that sh- uh, shares believe was out it's, oh, like, yeah. it's like oh god there she goes again she still believes or even Umbrella more recently with Rihanna yeah. I remember that was number one for like 10 weeks or something that was mad yeah and it wouldn't stop raining that was the one thing you remembered it literally didn't stop raining during that run and number one yeah, when she's not got her clothes off running around a wee farm near Bangor, she was making it rain. Exactly. There we go. But yes, back to Titanic. But as we avoid our segues, I think, I mean, once the disaster kicks, I think the fellow, it just goes into disaster mode. It's like the town inferno. That's pretty much what it is. It's the disaster movie. How are they going to get off? Will they get off? And who will survive? And... Yes, some of the little bits of special effects have dated, but another scene that really stuck in my mind from the rewatch, and it's a really small thing, it's a scene where it just shows you just how isolated in the middle of nowhere this ship is. So it's the fireworks going off. Not really, the firework is not the right way. Flare. To, the flare is the, is going off, and then the camera just pans back, and it's just black. It's, it's just, just black. It's just black, and you see this tiny dot of a ship in the middle of the Atlantic and you see the, the little bit of light and the the, the flare in the, in the sky and you're like, yeah, they are in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, plus they've only got one hour, two hours before it's sunk yeah. completely, so rescue, not happening. No. I think they said the earliest, the quickest the ship could get to them was three four hours. hours or something. Three, four mm-hmm. hours. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it's terrifying, but that is a brilliant shot. There's a very, very good book called On a Sea of Glass. If you ever, it's... It's a very like play by play of Titanic. It goes right back to kind of the the motivation as to why the ship had to be the fastest, why it had to be the biggest. But it literally goes like play by play of what happened. And on a sea of glass is a reference to the fact that the water was completely still. Like wow. there's such a contrast, like you said, with that shot where it pans out. You can see the sea's really calm. It doesn't mm-hmm. move. It's only once the ship starts to sink that the waves and the suction and all starts to happen and then it turns into disaster movie one oh one. And the unknown boy falls into the propeller. You know, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful to the day, but everyone remembers him. Everyone does. I mean, yeah. I talked and I was talking to two teenage girls the night we were going to see Cineworld. We the night we were going to see the film on Cineworld, and they were like, "Ah, oh, Jack and Rose, I love that we fell up. I love it." And it's like, it's like, yeah. What about when Don Fella falls into the propeller? And those are two girls that are like fifteen, sixteen. Like, yeah, that's pretty good. And you're like, there, there we go. I'm 40, they're 16, we can relate. Do you know the death that always gets me is Fabrizio with the funnel? Because he's, he's a survivor. He is trying so hard, like even after Tommy gets shot and he puts on the life belt and he's, he's he manages to avoid being sucked back into the ship at one point. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's, just, he's swimming for his life and the funnel just, that freaks me he's out He's even some saving reason. someone else as well. Like yeah. he's, he's using a knife to cut the lifeboats as well mm. that's a brilliant detail did you watch the the james cameron 20 years on documentary where he recreates how long it would have taken them to cut the ropes no no i didn't say that but that, uh, we'll get to another wee bit a bit <laughs> later on that the, the <laughs> controversy around titanic everyone always talks about but i didn't see that there no um i'd be interested in seeing it is it on like youtube or just um, somewhere 
it's on Disney Plus because it's got uh, it's Could. the National Geographic thing. But essentially, they it's a lifeboat that they kept from filming, and it's James Cameron cutting through the rope by himself, and it takes about a minute and forty seconds, and that's without any distractions or Jim, you know people what? jumping on him. Jim could have done it in a minute with his teeth. Oh, I. He could just do anything. <laughs> that's just James Cameron for you. Yeah, Bill Paxton would have done it with his earring. Oh, yeah, he just would have went. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're talking about death. Do you want a death that really sticks with me? It's you know as the ship's being upended and it's about to go under, and then there's the Jack and Rose are on the other side of the banisters or the, the railings, and it's just the, the woman who falls, and it's just it's this look of sheer hopelessness between Kate Winslet and her. It's like I can't really save you. you nothing, nothing really we can do, and then she just falls. It, it's just small things like that. Is that the blonde woman, or yeah. the, or I thought you were referring to the maid that literally just slips the whole length of, of the ship. One of the reasons Titanic endures so much is because like it was such a visual representation of class differences. But as soon mm-hmm. as that ship starts to sink, you could be first class or steerage. It did not matter. Mm-hmm. Rose and that girl did not matter that one of them was third class, one of them was first. They were both going to die. Yeah. Obviously, Rose doesn't. But I think that's a big part of why it endures. There was a big thing with the newspapers after the sinking where, because I believe it was J.J. Astor who died, and everyone was kind of like, oh, well, your millions didn't see if you did the J.J. Well, there's that bit as well. Like, even when, um, what do you call it? There's, like, he, I'm assuming he was a worker in the ship, the fellow with the hip flask. Yes. But he was a real person. I remember he, he was an inmate to remember as well. He was a chef who yeah. drank the night of the sinking, and then you see him with the flask in the film. Then he survived. He survived, and it's theorised that the... The alcohol kept the hypothermia at bay, and that's why he survived. All right, so if you're ever in a boat sinking, just get pissed. Yeah, pretty, fine. yeah that's the uh, takeaway from this. But no, no the, the, going back to the class thing, even when they are rescued in the other ship, whenever Cal goes to find Rose, he's being told, oh, no, no, you, you don't uh, need to look for her amongst, uh, mm-hmm. you, no, you shouldn't be down here because it's practically, you know, the steerage and lower class, whereas, you know, obviously the upper class would have been given nice wee cabins and all mm-hmm. that there. I'm assuming, I'm assuming, but yeah. Yeah, that, that is one bit I love about uh, Kathy Bates's character, Molly Brown. She... Because her, a lot of what you see of her in the film is what happened and she was really like, we need to turn back for these people. I don't care if they're crew, first class, steerage, whatever. We have to turn back. Mama says we have to go back. We have to go back. <laughs> oh, she's a bloody brilliant character in this. And oh yeah. She, I think she's a big thing for Jack and Rose. Like she kind of, she gives Jack the suit so he can kind of impress everybody at the dinner. She gives him the pencil that he writes on the wee bit of sheet for Rose. Like she's, She's well, shipping them. <laughs> well, no, no. Well, the thing is, like, she sees him as a person. She doesn't see, like, class yeah. at all. You know, she's class, colorblind, if that yeah. makes sense, if that's a term. About she's it. from New Money. Yeah, New yes, Money. Yes, she is. Well, her husband was, like, an oil, oil tycoon. Oil tycoon or yeah. something, yeah. I did. I took his money. I do love, I do love Kathy Bates in this. I mean, she's just a fantastic performer yeah. anyway. But, I mean, that scene you mentioned, Brown in the boat. Is is just great, and it's just it's what I love is like it's the silence of everyone around her, and this sense of like you can you just get a real sense of the the indignance, the disgust of Kathy Bates' character. It's that a great idea of, of what cinema is all about. Show me, don't tell me. Yes. And she's delivered this massive big speech, and then it's like the 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 the, the, the silence of everyone around her, and this kind of sense that she has to accept that. Yes, she has she, to accept she can't, that she can't do anything because yeah. your mom was ready for throwing her off the side. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but then there's the other sort of like a uh, ship officer. I think that was a true story as well. He decided to band a few boats together and then just and yes. have practically one boat empty to go back because there was only one boat in the end, wasn't it? That went back out of the twenty. There was twenty boats and eighteen were launched, but yeah, yeah there was one boat went back, and even that, it. Oh, it was too late by then. I mean, it, well, it was too late. I remember really vividly when I was a kid going to the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum and they have a brilliant Titanic exhibition where you go into the room and in the centre of the room is the Titanic mid-sinking and around the four corners it has first class, second class, third class and the uh, crew and in colour just raised above are all the survivors and then just below it's everyone that died and it's just those little grey figures like even as a kid I it just broke my heart. So 1,513 died? Yeah. Something it's like that? Mad. And they, yeah. only, they ended up only recovering 300 bodies, so a lot of people didn't get to grieve. Which, mm-hmm. like, how, how are you meant to grieve a body that's not... Like, even Thomas Andrews, like, his body was never found. Um, again, one thing that annoys me about Titanic, speaking of the first class, second class kind of class warfare, essentially, that was going on, 
that didn't stop after you died. First class people were prioritised in the rescue. They were embalmed and given coffins before any of the third class ones. They did manage to recover the band. All four of them were recovered and they ended up being together just by sheer chance. But they were stripped naked and put into the bottom of the boat in ice because they weren't deemed good enough to be given put, like put a, in a coffin, coffin or yeah. a box or something like that no it's it's mad there's so much about the titanic that endures for that kind of reason because that's it, it doesn't obviously happen to that extent anymore edwardian society wasn't isn't what it's like now but speaking as someone from a wee council estate if i was on titanic i probably would have been stuck in third class and tried to I wouldn't even be on Titanic. I can afford that. <laughs> I'd have probably been the guy that Jack, you know, won the cards, won won the tickets from the cards. I'd there's, be the fellow that hits the propeller. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, "That's great! I made it this far. Here we go, lads!" And then bang! Ah, oh, no. <laughs> you tried. Yeah, pretty much. This is why I can't have nice things. Pretty much, yeah. It'd be like, I can't believe my luck. I made it this far. Like the ship smashed in half. Everything. It's like, oh, it's glass. And then, oh no, I'm just losing my grip. Oh no. Oh, there's a propeller. Bang. I will say this. Just in relation to what Brown's talking about, well, well, we're all kind of talking about, I think the idea of the class hypocrisy that was going on on Titanic, personally, I think it's better handled in A Night to Remember. In what sense? I haven't seen the film. I do know there was a silent film literally just after the sinking, which mm-hmm. is in poor taste. There was a Nazi propaganda film about Titanic, but the whole point of that was because... Titanic was known as like the ship where the men went down like gentlemen. Mm-hmm. The British went down like gentlemen and the, the Germans essentially wanted to be like, actually, no, they didn't. I just get a sense from, it has been a little while. It's been about a year or two since I watched A Night to Remember. But that sense, it's not overshadowed by the big romance that it's front and centre of James Cameron's film. Well, that seems to be a difference. Like Cameron focuses on the romance, the disasters, backseat and the class yeah. warfare, whereas The Night to Remember seems to be like an inverse of that. Yeah, The yeah. Night to Remember is kind of much more trying to be factual. Mm-hmm. But you do get a sense of the British class system in total crisis in this sense of an iceberg does not curve your first or second or third class. The the Atlantic, the, the, the ice cold Atlantic water does not care what class you are. I like both films. I know that Titanic uses the love angle to bring people in that might not necessarily want to go see that film. And it's a good thing because then they become more aware of what happened and aware of this disaster. But I think A Night to Remember is much more factual in what it's trying to do. And not to say that Titanic isn't, but it's just the sense that the romance that's there is kind of taken away. And when my problem is that I don't necessarily by that romance that's why I'll always prefer a night to remember I'm curious just um, from what you were saying there because obviously the romance you're seeing everything from essentially from the, the perspective of Rose and Jack mm-hmm. but in a night to remember is it more balanced like it gives more it's much more of an ensemble in. right it's much more of an ensemble I need to rewatch it I'll, I'll openly admit but um, it's much more all those kind of key things we're talking about like the that, that key moment when Andrews is kind of talking to people about the ship and the fact that it's it's hopeless, it's going to go down and I feel that's there. It's not caught up with the melodrama of having just about five minutes before, you know, Jack or Rose trying to use an axe to, to cut the handcuffs of Rose. They're both good films. I'm not criticised. I know I'm comparing one with the other, but I would say to people who, and there is people out there who are listening or people I know will get put off by watching a film because it's black and white. Because, oh, it's a film from 1950. No way would I be interested in that. I know people who are like that. I would say, look, give A Night to Remember a chance. Yes, visually there will be things that dated, but there's things about this film that have already dated. Like, I was worried. It's like, oh, do, do the sequence where they show the video of the recreation of the Titanic one. It's like, oh, Jesus, that's not the special effects they're going to use <laughs> for this. It's like, those are really bad. Those are bad, it's like, thankfully it's not. I mean, yeah, there's a couple of things, and I think there's a whole, like, they recreated, was it miniatures they used for the ship? Yeah, and, like, 3D scan them or something like that there to make them, mm-hmm. you know, like, they would have people interact on them and that. But I think it's, like we said, coming out of it, the thing, the CGI that works is when it's used in sharp cuts, mm-hmm. so you don't notice it, really. But when there's long, sprawling shots, like, I think even when the ship during the daytime or something like that, and you can see, like, people move, but it doesn't feel like they're yep. real people. It feels like they're just, like, you know, little CG characters. Uh, 
walking on the ship, that stuff doesn't work as well. That's what's aged. But everything mm-hmm. else, I think, is pretty solid. Okay. Well, look, I think we've, we have rambled on quite a bit. And Joe, I know you wanted to talk about one key point of Titanic. Because I've already mentioned the fact that Rose makes it to the end, but Jack don't. Jack doesn't make it, you know. He's not there for the closing credits. What? He, he's not there for back with Bill Paxson and going, why have you got an earring? He's not there. He's somewhere at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Frozen stiff. Yeah. yeah a Leo the, icicle. The, the Caprio popsicle? I don't know. I was trying to think of something there. No, it doesn't work. Um, I have to say... In all the years I've watched Titanic, I've never really had an issue over whether or not they could both fit on the... It's a door, isn't it, essentially, what they're on? Yeah, a wardrobe door or something like that. Because I think the film each time kind of answers that question. When you go, wouldn't they both fit? It's like, they, they, they do... They both can fit on, on it, but it's just with the weight of the two of them, they keep turning it out yes, over. that's yeah. not the issue. That, it's the buoyancy, like you were saying, yeah. Joe. Yeah. No, the thing is, right, people always go, oh, they could both do it and they both fit, not, no problem. The film clearly shows you they both try, mm-hmm. but it starts to tip like you were saying. Like just buoyancy just means you can't do it. I think Mythbusters a few years ago said, "Well, if uh, Rose removed her life jacket and tied it underneath the door, they both could have fit." And it's like, yeah, is that the first thing you're going to think of? You know, <laughs> whenever you're you're in no. freezing cold water, you know, I'm going to take off this one thing that's keeping me afloat at the minute just to see if I can put it in the bottom of the store to keep it going. So you're like, technically yes, but. Practically, no, it's not going to work. That's that's just basically saying if people have a cool, calm, level head in disaster and they don't get flustered and, you know, you're about to possibly die, the hypothermia is starting to set and it's like, no, no it's, I know what I'm going to do. I've seen <laughs> it on a YouTube video once. Yeah, and, but, and I bet those guys, if they were in a situation, would never think of that in a million years because mm. they'd be like, it's freezing, I'm going to drown, blah, 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 all the different things. But, yeah, like I was saying, I think, there's another National Geographic documentary because it's the 25th anniversary now. It's a bit different from the one you're referring to, I think, where he actually tested it with stunt people with the same body mass as uh, uh, Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio. I think they take it from the point where the other passenger tries to use Rose as a, you know, like a float. A, a boy, essentially. Yeah, a boy, essentially. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they were like, right, they'll will cool the waters to close to what it was like in the Pacific and they're wearing the same kind of clothes. And so, sure enough, they do that part and he like punches the stuntman twice or three times and then they reach the door. They try it multiple times. Like like you said, like in the film where they both try and go on it, buoyancy just means it flips. They did try it once when Jack gets on the door, but he is so cold because he's wearing practically nothing. His the, like, stuntman's arms shaking, mm-hmm. shaking, shaking, and then he just slips into the water. He's like, I can't balance in this. So technically, yes, they both could fit in the door, but... Practically no. And Plus, that doesn't when you, mean they would have survived. Like you're saying, yeah. Jack didn't have a bloody... He had a, he had a shirt on? That's yeah. all he had on. And not just that. If you... You know, a character like Jack, who loves... You know, when like, established by the film, loves her no matter what, he's going to do everything in his power to make sure she survives. So he wouldn't want to put her at risk no matter what. So that's what, like, no, you sit in the door, love. I'll just, I'll just paddle about here. Hopefully your fellow with the whistle is going to get a wee lifeboat in a wee second. <laughs> It'll be all right. That scene where that boat comes back and she's kind of... Half frozen. I mean, that's horrifying. It's horrifying, and that kind of the, when you're coming round, she's been, she's unconscious. She kind of comes round, and she she hears them, and the kind of little the voice and the sense that they're not gonna come back. And then she has to go into the water to get the whistle. Oh man, yeah. I, that's 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 how Jimmy flexing his muscles, put on tugging on them heartstrings. He knows what he does when he, he knows pull, what to do. he knows what he's doing when he's pulling on heartstrings. But Victoria, what about you? I mean, did you ever really have an issue about whether they could both fit on that little door? No, and it's for the exact same reason Joe said. They show you in the film mm-hmm. that it's not doable. Like, like people who go on and on about the bloody door and have the meme have clearly never actually watched the film. They just know it from memes. Mm-hmm. And it, it really annoys me. And the funny thing is, in that documentary... Brian's going to get angry. <laughs> in that thing, he's like, no, no matter what, if they could fit or not, I had to kill Jack. <laughs> just <laughs> like, what, are you going to have, like, Billy Zane come across and, like, one of the boats and just shoot him in the water? There was a brilliant thing my mum told me last night when she went to see Titanic when it was first out, when Billy Zane's chasing him with the gun and he slips on the, like, bit of wood or something that he shot. I... Apparently the whole screen cheered. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, I wish people had done that last night. Here, I think we need to talk more about Billy Zane. He's, I was going to say, we brilliant. haven't really talked about Billy Zane. Lead the way, Jim. He's just stupendous. He's just a proper... 
I, I'll go to, as far as say, he's a proper pantomime villain. He's someone you want to boo and hiss. And I think yeah. the film needs that. For I, I guess it's coming back to that idea of to buy that romance. You've got to have that type of villain. I think he is OTT. I think Billy Zane knows that and he's ramping it up to 11 on the kind of boo hiss factor. But without him, you don't really, again, without him, I don't think the relationship works at all. I think if he was someone who was playing it much more underplayed in the sense that he is slightly controlling the fact that he is a bastard he's a pro- i'm sorry <laughs> he's the complete opposite of jack that's the appeal yeah yeah and he's a proper bastard in that sense of there's the scenes kind of when they're having breakfast together and he just kind of loses the the rag with with rose in the sense of that's not how i my want my fiance to behave and you're like oh fuck up <laughs> <laughs> like you said in the in hindsight watching titanic after the me too movement like it was a heartbreaking scene anyway, but now you're like, oh, how many women have had to endure that because they couldn't leave? And there's a wee scene uh, even in that, just after that, where it's the maid, I think, is coming in to kind of clean up oh, and God, she's in tears. Yeah. And Trudy. she's just, That's her name. And you're just Trudy. like, yeah. I, would, I would like some tea, Trudy, when I return to my room. Wait, yeah. Am I right in saying that Trudy was the one who slipped the whole way down the ship? I, I think it I was. Think was. Listeners, oh. email in. Please do. She, she didn't make that tea. <laughs> <laughs> sorry that's, that's pretty sorry about that um, she was away getting the tea bags and then she's like I've got them in one hand I was like oh no I can't hold up oh no <laughs> that's awful sorry but anyway, we're, uh, bad. we're bad people I know I shouldn't be doing that but um, yeah Billy Zane's fantastic him with his guy liner and uh, oh, also sorry David Warner's just as good yeah. as his like you know his man my, my, my man. only thing is though <laughs> And I know, again, it's come back to, I think, you need those villains there for the romance to work. It's like, once all hell breaks loose, I'm like, David Warner, just kind of do your own thing. You know, he's know. he's still like, it's like, okay, yeah, no problem, Billy's in. We'll do this, we'll do that. And it's like, mate, seriously, would you not be like trying to, A, trying to get yourself off the boat or do something instead of just like, let's follow Ryan, let's find Ryan. There's a scene where he's just sitting um, with Leo's character chained up and it's like, Oh, it looks like the boat's going to sink. It's like, yeah, I try and get fucking yeah, off, get David. The fuck out. <laughs> See, I think uh, it, it works to a point where he's with Cal. He's like, all right, he's going to get me off the boat with him. It's fine. But it's whenever Cal steals his gun and runs away, that's the point where you should go, uh, what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> you know, I yeah, should be nah, trying for a life. <laughs> no, but there's, um, apparently there's a deleted scene as well where him and Jack have a big fight after Billy Zane chases him. Apparently Billy Zane's character goes back and goes, oh, get them, my man, or whatever. <laughs> and then uh, It's like Billy Zane's in the room. That, that's why, yeah, when, you know when the boat splits, you see his head's all bloodied and that there. Okay. That's from that fight they had, apparently. Okay. Oh, but, I just assumed it was, he injured himself yeah, so as, I, as the ship was breaking that, apart. It works two ways, like, yeah. but that's the reasoning because there's that deleted yeah. scene. But James Cameron's like, Nah, looking back, it was kind of stupid, so I don't know why I put it in. <laughs> Can I also say, just while we're mentioning, and I know we're going to have to wrap things up, but yeah. for characters and actors that don't get, or that we haven't really mentioned, Jeanette Goldstein as the Irish mammy, you know, the she's the girl from, she's an alien. Vasquez, she's, yeah. Yeah, she's Vasquez in Aliens. She's given so little screen time what to do, but we were talking earlier on about that, you know, near to my God, to the she's just putting the children to bed and she's telling them a little story oh my god it just breaks my little heart that's that's a perfect example of someone giving a very small role and making the absolute most of it mm-hmm. it's perfect you, know, she's you, perfect you remember her yeah. for that scene she's yeah. she's incredible exactly yeah even yeah. the likes of your fellow that plays Guggenheim and stuff like that there he decides to go down with the ship as a as gentleman ge- as gentleman even mm-hmm. though he wasn't really like a gentleman not wasn't really. no. <laughs> but anyway uh, and Bernard Fox as well who's Bernard Fox he again? is Archibald Gracie. Oh, is he uh, the yes. one that leaves the ship? It... No, that's Bruce, no, that's Bruce Ismay. No, the guy with the mustache and he's in his his fancy dressing gun. Who's Archibald? He was another bloody millionaire. There was loads of them on that oh, ship. Yeah. Like essentially, he's, the entire. He's in that scene at the lunch. Oh, the big like over the top. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. yeah I just yeah, love Bernard yeah, Fox. Great. You know, he's yeah. just one of those great performers that I love to see. Um, look, I think we we have talked quite a bit. I do want to come back to one final scene of Titanic. And that, of course, is the last scene. You know, I thought the old lady threw it in the sea. I went back and got it. No, not the Britney sequence. But, of course, and hang on a minute. Let me just get her name up in front of me. We haven't really mentioned... We haven't mentioned Gloria Stewart, who, again, is given very little screen time, 
But it's a very important part of this film and she does, again, the most of what she has to do. I always get this confused with the deleted scene. Is it where oh, she... Oh, it's awful. Like the, the whole crew like approach her going, no, Rose, don't oh, throw the jewel into the ocean and all that there. And you're like, oh, thank God you never went with that because yeah. you would have killed that film. But in the theatrical cut, she passes away in her sleep, mm-hmm. surrounded by the photographs of all her friends and family. I will say this openly. I mean, I, I'm someone who cries the drop of a hat and maybe it's just having went through my, my father past and that scene hits differently now for me as someone who's in my 40s that sense of returning to the ship the door being opened and everyone being there then Leo but as we said Joe what about her husband? Ah, he's not worth it To be fair To be fair Oh Brian's on the defensive <laughs> again take, She's take. on the no, offensive on. To be fair we find out Rose obviously goes on to live she becomes an actress She's still part of Edwardian society. She probably married a guy for stability and security. It doesn't necessarily mean she didn't love him, mm-hmm. but it's a different kind of love. And even like but you were he should be there, Brian. I, mm, he was there for most of her life. <laughs> what, what if he was a dick? We don't know that. Well, he could have been another no. movie. And we I don't. Know. I think there's a line where she talks about she loves her grand. She loved your. She yeah, talks no, to she the says, granddaughter. I loved your grandfather. She says to her granddaughter I love your I grandfather. I loved your grandfather. But kind of love. Don't be an apologist for Jack. I loved your grandfather <laughs> but see Jack he was a ride. That's what he she says. That's it. That is it. <laughs> it's like, it was a great wee weekend apart from the boat sinking but you know I did love your granddad. Anytime I'm out for a drive in the car. Jesus I had wee flashbacks to, to oh, old Jack. My hot hot flush. <laughs> oh Jesus. <laughs> The other thing was watching it again. And yeah, I know, I mean, I know I'm saying it had an emotional effect in me and it did hit me. It did hit me watching it is the fact that wouldn't it have been funny if when she died and when she was on the ship, it wasn't Kate Winslet's character that went up to meet Jack. It was just the older version of Rose. They should have, you know, if, if James Cameron had balls, he should have went for that. He's like, no, tough luck. You what know. always sticks with me about that scene, because it obviously it transitions from the photos. And it's clearly stuff that her and Jack talked about, like where it has the photo of her and the horse where she's mm-hmm. not riding side saddle. Mm-hmm. And it kind of goes down into the ship and it's all rotted and covered in rust. And then it slowly transitions mm-hmm. into the ship and the colours and everything. And yeah, it becomes vibrant. And when, I, when I was a kid, like my, my family aren't religious, but my mum always said essentially what happens to Rose. She believes that Rose, when she dies, has gone to her happiest moment that is her version of heaven mm-hmm. and oh, when I was a kid I found that really comforting you said about near death experiences anyway you hear stories like oh you always remember the, the best moments of your life and that there but then I'm starting to think that ship how was that the best moment could you not have like <laughs> before had, it sank. could you not be like on land somewhere with all these lovely people not on that bloody boat that killed somebody <laughs> <laughs> no, it like, gets me though because like the oh, no, no, don't get me wrong. It is a lovely sequence when it shows the band and it shows Thomas Andrews. Like, it's everyone, yeah. Because uh, Thomas Andrews, he's at the top of the stairs and he kind of like turns round and then it's yeah, like he's, there's he's, somebody else here to see you. He's so regal oh, and Jack's elegant. Up and he's up there. <laughs> it's the on big ride, Jack. Fun fact, listeners: where we are currently recording the podcast in Q Radio in Belfast, we are less than sixty feet from where Thomas Andrews stayed when he was an apprentice for Harland and Wolf. Mm-hmm. Literally, the streets that we walk in Belfast are where he would have walked. I'm sure there's that, a house there. And it's literally <laughs> probably blood, is, it's, yeah. It's I'm probably not even That's You know, probably they demolished it, probably, or knocked oh, it down. Oh, no, no. It's, no, beside, it's, office it's, okay. it's beside the Warhammer shop. There we go. Yeah. Well, just as high he would have wanted. Does he? I can just picture the actor playing. <laughs> you know, when like Kate and uh, Leo are running past him, he's playing like Warhammer. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, oh, the pieces are starting to slide off the oh, board. <laughs> I can never paint it as good as others. He, he can't focus because the, the boat swans so. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh God, per Thomas Andrews. Again, can sorry. I, can sorry. I just say, I know it's not involving Thomas Andrews, but um, just because, Brian, you're throwing out some Titanic facts. I know I've mentioned my love for Night to Remember as well. Um, I, for, I Apologies in advance. I don't know the name of the play. Brian probably will. But I know there is a play about the court cases after the court case afterwards about kind of figuring out what actually went wrong on the Titanic I know Thomas Andrews of course sadly passed on the boat but there is a lot of references to him in in that play and I would I would yeah I would recommend anybody if they can seek it out I know around the time Belfast and around bigger anniversaries they had it a couple of years ago I think at Belfast City Hall the performances were going on I could be wrong on that I forget the name of the play. If anyone's listening, if they know it, do email in and let me know. But I got to see that. I think it was around the 20th anniversary 
for Titanic and they had it and it is an absolute fanta- absolutely fantastic stage play in that sense of just very stripped down just basically reading transcripts from the court case afterwards as they, as they figured out exactly what had went wrong No, I can't say I've ever heard of it but that sounds brilliant like hopefully if there's a revival of it anytime mm. soon I'll definitely seek yeah, it out yeah definitely that sounds amazing I shall seek it out and get some factoids for you but Brian we're talking about Titanic I know there's something, and, and I think it's become quite clear, listeners, throughout this recording, someone clearly has a lot more knowledge. She's not just our resident Disney queen, she's our resident Titanic queen. So, yes, Brian, you have a lot of interest, a lot of knowledge about Titanic, and I know that you want to talk about an event that's coming up later this year. Yes, um, obviously, as you can tell from the podcast, I am very passionate about this subject. I reached out to the Titanic Society here in Belfast a couple of months ago and I spoke to the head of it, Aidan, and I said to him, why why does no one cover what happens directly after the sinking? There's the whole shipbuilding industry in Belfast. There's the play-by-play of when the ship leaves dock and when it goes under the water. <laughs> then they skip over that bit and then they go straight to the survivors and the inquest and the investigation after. That bit where they recover the bodies is always left out. And it, it never sat right with me. It goes it goes back to that little exhibition at the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum. Those little people, those little grey figures, they were people. Like, what what happened to them? Did they go down with the ship? Did they get rescued? What what, would, what happened to them in the water? So, Aidan was kind enough to let me do a little talk in May of this year. Um, I'll get dates out to people if you're interested. But essentially, the talk is going to be looking at the body recovery effort done by it was mostly just regular blokes over in Halifax in Nova Scotia they were just regular steam cable ship guys who volunteered to go get these bodies like these guys are really like an unsung hero kind of part of the Titanic story that doesn't get told a lot and I think that that really sticks with me because these they, these were people their story deserves to be told and there's so much nuance to what happened and it's it, it, it's a fascinating part of the story that just isn't told a lot so if you're interested in coming to the talk, it'll be at the Titanic Hotel and I will get you details. That sounds fab. Victoria, I mean, I would definitely look forward to that and we'll throw the details up on our website. But look, just before we go, do any of us here have any personal connections with Titanic? I believe I do. I know on you my... You believe? On my mum's on my side of the family, we definitely had someone Text who Mrs Brown now <laughs> and find out. They worked in the shipyard and I know, I believe it was my nana's... My nana's nana watched the ship during the sea trials like she went up to cave hill in belfast and just watched it. like can you imagine the sheer spectacle of that you'd never people in belfast had never seen anything like that but there's one thing that always sticks with me from my childhood and it's my great aunt and uncle mona and david they said that everyone who worked on the ship was quite superstitious and according to them not only was there a woman in white seen walking the docks apparently you're a nan Oh, I'm a nan. Uh, <laughs> apparently, there was never any rats around the ship during the building of it, and according to old Belfast superstition, that is not a that's a bad omen. The, the exact way my uncle David worded it was she was doomed from the start. Okay, good old positive oh, Belfast I... outlook. I mean, for me, I mean, Joe, do you have any connection? No, not really. <laughs> um, I... No, I've I, like it. I think my granny would have like harped on about it if she knew anyone that mm-hmm. was involved in the construction or the ship in any way. You know, be it traveling out there. So, no, no real connection to kind uh, no real connection to Titanic beyond the film. Mm, well, the McMullen clan from my granny's side, uh, we were involved. I know my great grandfather could be getting that right. Was involved in the building of the staircase, and it's now you can see it at Titanic Exhibition Centre only on special Sundays. I don't know if they've changed that or not. You can have afternoon tea in the staircase. And I went a couple of years ago with my lovely mum and we talked about that story, about how my great-grandfather helped build the staircase, to which my, my late father's response at the time, no wonder it sank. No wonder it sunk. And you're like, oh, well, thanks, Dad. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Typical Dad response. Like. <laughs> Typical Dad. Okay. So, look, I think without any further ado, I think we'll wrap this pod up. So all that's really left for me to do is thank my guests. Thank you very much, Joe. Thanks, Jim. Thank you very much, Victoria. Thanks, Jim. Thanks very much for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode. But for now, I think just before we go, Joe, give us a wee rendition. Every night in my dreams, 
I see you, I feel you. And I think I should stop there because we don't want to get sued by Miss Dion. That's true. Goodbye.